How the hell are you? Hey. Yeah. <laughs> um, and just so you know, um, just to, to double check, this is okay. I'm I'm recording uh, this uh, this Zoom. Is that all right? Cool. Of course, no problem. Okay, no problem at all. Um, yeah. So, how are you guys uh, bearing up? Where, whereabouts are you? Just now, just from. Uh, we, I'm in the York. Right. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's a bit crazy. It's just crazy. unprecedented, as they say. But um, oh. very, very, very strange. So, who, uh, who, who are you? Who are you with? What are you, your family? Um, uh, I've got my wife and three kids. So, one primary school, two high school. Um, so, a house uh, full. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm out in my office at the moment, so <laughs> I'm going to get back in shortly and just uh, assist where I can. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been a, a strange one. I, I kind of, um, after we met obviously a few weeks ago and came back and uh, the news all started to creep rather rapidly. Um, and then it was like, lockdown almost straight away mm. i've i've had to all kind of isolate because i'm diabetic as well right so okay so they change their mind every day who's high risk and who isn't but um mm -hmm. latest news was i haven't but two days ago I was so i don't really know so I, I think the thing is just to be careful more than anything else you know you're like well if you know you have a uh, you, you know a, a health issue that you, know, you, you would normally monitor then yeah be super yeah. careful you know I'm just, uh, I haven't been over the door for the last week, really, so. Um, it's just the slightest thing that goes wrong with people at the moment. If they get a cold or a sore throat, they mind starts to drift to, oh, I might have this and I might have that, even though they're probably likely just to have a cold or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but we're okay. How's things with you? Uh, yeah, yeah, we're fine. Um, my um, my family's all sort of spread out all over the place. I'm, I'm at home with my wife and... Um, who really doesn't like me very much. Um, <laughs> no, she, she's just going to... Is that kind of, a statement or is that to do with COVID-19? <laughs> no, uh, we're, we're actually all fine. She's, she's someone who's, who's always worked and is always out and about. So she's kind of like, you know, um, and I'm just going to... It doesn't help when I deliberately wind her up and I'm like, I'm sure there's some washing or something you, you could be doing, you know. Yeah, just uh, <laughs> probably not the best, but um, but no, we're just we're just trying to keep our spirits up and kind of keep things light. And um, um, she she and I are sort of very similar in that we're two people who just kind of get on with things and just. Yeah. Uh, and I'm a relentlessly positive person. Um, anyway, so um, I'm just kind of like, okay, this is the way it's going to be, and that's what we got to do. Um, I kind of. Anticipated lockdown a few days ago. I was like, "Hmm, I'm going to go into my studio and bring all my important bits of kit home, so that I could literally be fully operational from from the house um, if need yeah. be." Which I'm glad. Uh, so, literally over the weekend and yesterday, I've been working on music and being able to record bits and pieces for clients. And um, and then today, I'm um, finishing building a website for somebody. And you know, it's just. It's just being active, and, and I think that's that's kind of how it works for me generally. I'm kind of like I'd rather be busy, being active, doing things, and um, otherwise you just spend too much time in your head. Yeah. I know, I know. I'll be over, my office at the bottom of the garden, really. So um, I've got everything I could need. I've got my all my kit in here. I've got my bikes. I've got a treadmill. <laughs> is is that a copy of Be More Pirate? It is. Yes. So I just recognised the, the the cover. I was kind of like, I'm sure that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've got it sitting right there. <laughs> I've, got, I've got it. It's yeah. over there. It was a, it's quite quite a lot of um, quite a bit too much pirate and not enough kind of lessons in it for me. But it's a good book. But I, I kind of want yeah. to the pirate theme get back into how this affects business. Yeah, I mean, I it was actually the thing that was hilarious was I, I I bought it accidentally because I was looking at a Seth Godin book. Uh, oh, yeah. And I think it was like Purple Cow or something like that. And yeah. and this was like recommended next to it. And, and I ended up accidentally clicking on it. 
and then I, I was like, "What the hell's that book?" When when it came through, it was not what I what I'd ordered. Yeah. So I was like, "All right, so, can't join it." It's, um, it's just there's a lot. I, I feel as if I know more about pirates than what I needed to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously, this, these are things that we, we need um, on a daily basis to know more about pirates. Um, so, uh, in the interest of trying to remain sane and, and trying to kind of yeah. be normal, um, <laughs> shall we? Um, basically conduct a normal kind of conversation that I would normally do on on my podcast and um, we'll try very hard not to mention coronavirus. Yeah. When do you broadcast it when you do something? Whenever. I mean, at the moment, I'm just kind of like, because everything's changed, I've, I've got other stuff that's been recorded already, but it's a bit light or or, or not necessarily light. It's just, it, I think the, there needs to be a certain acknowledgement of what's happened or... Uh, yeah. You just, I, I just think, you know, tonally, you don't want to be glib or um, that kind of thing. So, um, I've, I mean, I've got some of that stuff, and that, that it's fine. So, but it's more likely that this will go out sooner rather than later. You know. Right. Okay. Okay. So there might be the odd flip into current context from a yeah um, a conversation point of view. Oh, you know, no, totally. I mean, I, I think, I think that's that's the whole thing. You know, um, I think we can't um, we can't ignore it. But, um, it just uh, it is what it is, but um, yeah, cool. Anyway, so uh, for the folks at home, uh, a quick 30 seconds of who you are and what you're about. Yeah, no bother. Thank you for, for having me. Uh, no, just, there's really not much else we could do at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, so, Scott Leeper. Um, how far back shall I go? Um, I was a retailer to trade. That's where I started my career. And um, I used to sell sports shoes Monday to Friday in kilts on a Saturday. Right. And uh, I felt I wasn't really good at selling, but I was good at teaching other people how to sell. So I fell into a world of learning and development um, kind of by accident because I was good at understanding customer service and helping people to... to um, find their way within that environment. So when I was in my early teens, I was looking after small concessions and outlets. Um, and then in my early 20s, started to do retail management. And again, not great at sales, but fairly decent at managing people and realized that I had a good talent for it and uh, started. And then at that point in time, when I was 20, 21, started studying again because school wasn't really my my... My, uh, my skill and my craft, I wasn't the, the best student but um, other than art, but uh, I found myself right back in the field of, of learning as well and uh, spent, you know, since I was age 20, just studying, you know, learning and development and all the different lessons on leadership and management I could absorb myself into. And then my last real job before, uh, before I went into self-employment was working for... Uh, the cooperative group so I walked across different businesses but I decided on day one that I wanted to be there for five years try and work in all five businesses that they had in order to get a field in uh, consultancy before I went into a kind of self-employed world but that whole being good at art at school stuck with me I was obviously trying to do things in a creative way in a different way all the way through that before I even started in consultancy. Mm -hmm. So when, when did you start consulting then? 11 years ago um, so just kind of smack bang in the middle of the world markets crashing and everything. I thought, why not start a business? <laughs> why not do something Perfect different? Perfect timing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, uh, I went, to, I went to a conference in Glasgow and, uh, I took two sets of business cards with me. One that said off the wall training and one that said the learning lab to see which name fitted best. <laughs> And the nice. off-the-wall thing was too off-the-wall. that People couldn't create the identity of what it actually meant, but I wasn't quite deciding on, uh, decided rather on what, um, what my identity in my business was going to be at that point in time. I, uh, I was still in the employed role at that point in time, so I hadn't had my redundancy at that point in time that I managed to secure eventually. So I went to a business angel and asked for investment. Or somebody I knew and said, if, if I don't get a redundancy package where I am, would you invest in my business as well? So I was determined I was going to do it. Um, but my whole my whole philosophy at the beginning of it was to try and create a different brand of learning and doing things in a different way was, was what I wanted to try and do with my business. Now that's the desire. The reality is when you start that business, you have to take any work you can get rather than 
Yeah, they want, I'm just they want to be doing, this one thing. You know, they do luxury stuff you want to be doing. So, um, so, so that was 11 years ago, and it's uh, progressed rather speedily from, from there, really. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, when you're thinking at that stage, you're talking to angel investors, and you, you're like, okay, um, you're, you're not necessarily that super clear about the path that you're going to take. No. What? What was your pitch? Just kind of like, give me some money. I don't really know what I'm going to be doing, but you know, <laughs> you know it's kind of. I, I knew. But here's I the knew general it. focus. Yeah. One of the person, one of the people I approached, I knew pretty well um, because they had I had worked for them in a previous career, and um, I showed them the the volume of business that I would grow over a twelve month time period. So I had pretty much said to them, "Look, over twelve months, I'm confident I can pay back the investment you gave me to start up." And the investment I really required was for securing three months' salary in the bank um, to invest in any equipment I might need to get started, um, to have all those things in place. Now, I, I found I didn't actually end up needing it, but actually the process of thinking I needed it was actually quite important because it meant I was able to then sit down and do a business plan for it. And mm-hmm. um, I did a thing called a, a go in your own checklist, which was a list of like 35 questions around things that you you should be able to do when you're self-employed that maybe you're not quite certain you can do. Right. Um, And then uh, put together a bit of a comprehensive business plan for it. And then I approached them. They offered me an investment for it, but I subsequently refused it because I ended up managing to negotiate a redundancy where I was working to to start off on my own. So do you find being a creative person that the idea of business plans and you know and that kind of level of you know focusing on the sort of that kind of process was you know people can be kind of divided into sort of two sides i'm, I'm very creative so i'm kind of a bit airy fairy and all over the place but it's then being able to kind of bring that together in something that's more cohesive so something like a business plan did you struggle with that or or no, not did not, no. <laughs> I didn't write it, I drew it. <laughs> so I found another See, there you go. It's, a bit, it's, it's what, what's yeah. your kind of natural kind I of process. To, so and, you know. it's, like, it's like the ultimate procrastinator. I had to start with a good graphic before I could start with a good plan. Yeah. So, you know, I spent ages on the color, the color of it, <laughs> on the detail of it. And then I looked at lots of different ways to do planning rather than just a traditional way of doing planning. Um, I did like a dream list and a goals list and ambitions list and stuff like that. Um, I did that go you know checklist that I created for it. I, um, I did a picture of success and drew that out what it looked like for me and everything. And then obviously I had to do the most difficult part was actually doing the the detail and monetary sense in terms of what work would bring in, what income, what your rates are, and and how you would earn and how you would do those things and what areas you see in your business in. And then when you get to the next page, you start to write examples of what the work would look like. That's when your creative energy could, could flow into it. But for me, it's kind of about tendencies. There's some things I'm stronger at than others and mm-hmm. creativity is somewhere I'm strong and detail is not an area I'm strong. And it's not to say that I can't do detail, but I just get bored with it quite quickly and I have to... I was just going to say you can't be, can't be arsed when it gets to that stage. <laughs> yeah, so I just, I just don't spend as long on it, but I realise the critical importance of it because nobody's going to give me investment unless I do the detail. Yeah. So I just yeah. have to do it in shorter bursts and shorter periods of time to do the detail on it and just break away from it and go and watch Bargain Hunt at 12.15 rather than actually do two hours work on it because it just gives me a space to come back to it the right amount of energy. I think that that's a really um, valuable point because, you know, it's dead easy. And especially at the moment when all of us, all of us uh, for the most part, you know, there's an awful lot of us are working from home um, because we kind of have to. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of people are kind of going, oh, I should be doing this. I should be doing that. Um, and kind of maybe not necessarily focusing on what it is that they're actually achieving in a, a period of time, but thinking, oh, I, if they normally do nine to five, then I should be doing nine to five. But everything's kind of different. Everything's up in the air. So stop over judging ourselves and actually, you know, you need to allow that time, especially for the creative side of things. Um, you need to be able to step away and, like you say, find that energy and then come back to it. Um, I've not, I, I must have, I, I wouldn't position this as a debate because I've seen people posting stuff this week on LinkedIn about here's the rhythm of homework and how homework. Mm. Homeworking should look, 
I haven't felt it's the right environment to go in and say, well, I think it's this and you think it's that, because I think any opinion is a healthy opinion at the moment to get people to think in different ways about homeworking. But for me, um, I think you have to find a rhythm that really works for you, that gives you the right, you know, physical momentum about how you do your work, but also mental space to mm. exercise around everything. So if, I, if I'm in my office here today working and I've done three hours work, and then I get a break in the day and I can go out and maybe do half an hour's worth of gardening and get some fresh air in the back garden, then that's going to be more beneficial for me to do an hour, two hours worth this afternoon than it is to do five hours solid and yes. say I've done my work for the day. Um, I know that people say don't have your distractions. I saw a colleague of mine post something earlier on this morning, actually, around he, he was asking what's your opinion on having a TV on when you're working from home. Now, we're on, we're on recording at the moment, but in the background, I've got a TV screen up in the, in the wall. And I normally have something on in the background because as a creative person, it helps me to have noise and other things to help mm -hmm. me to focus because if it's all just concentrated on the detail of what I'm doing, it doesn't really work for me as an approach. But then that's going to be different for, for every person and what their preference is of approach. But I don't think there's a, a one-size-fits-all approach to homework. I just think you have to find the rhythm of what works best best for you um, and find you know a, a principle that works I mean I've, I've been on call since five o'clock this morning with Australia so I came back I did two calls one at five one at quarter to six and then I went back to my bed for an hour or so and then I come back out to my office to do a little bit of work I'll do a recording now and then I'll probably grab some lunch go for a short run in the treadmill or something and then I'll probably maybe just break until about three o'clock and then do another couple of hours work. Now, across the working day, I've still done a working day, but I've broken it up in a way that yeah. works for my energy and the mental space that I need at the moment as well to not be too focused on, you know, all the horrible stuff that's, that's happening out there. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to find the right physical space to do things. And, you know, you, you'll have, people will have more time on their hands than what they know because they're not used to being at home all the time and the distractions of home. But, you know, my wife's outside at the moment with three kids and although she's used to work, being at home because she, we both work in our business, um, I'm also conscious of the fact there's three kids who are being schooled at home this week. So I, I need to be conscious of the fact that when I go back into the house, I can't just go back into the house and grab my things, come back out and do my work. I need to also spend a lot of time supporting that because we don't have the kids out at school every single day so we just have to be really considerate and respectful for each other at the moment and yeah just respect that people will do homework in different ways and when we have conversations with people if we're managing teams and we'll chat about how they're doing things it's not like being in an office when you see someone who they're maybe distracted by their mobile phone or that distraction on the mobile phone might actually be a positive than a negative yes that distraction of somebody wanting to you know go outside and breathe or watch the TV for a bit can actually be a positive rather than a negative. I just think we have to be quite careful about judgment on circumstances at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's an awful lot of things that up until recently, you know, there would have been, like you say, a certain amount of judgment towards it, but everything's just been kind of turned on its head. So um, it's, it's a certain amount of, okay, if that works for you, if that's a coping mechanism, yeah. or then, then, then that's good. You know, that's going to work back to, um, you know your original business plan and, and what what you started out doing work-wise how's how's that differed over the years is it you know um, um yeah. it drastically or yeah i just think uh, the first 12 months it's about survival in your business you know a lot of businesses die after 12 months um then when you get into the second 12 months it's you can start to prosper a little bit in terms of the things that you're focusing on. And then if you get as far as month three, you start to thrive a bit more. So um, I think one of my friends called it um, thrive, drive and survive. It's survive, drive and thrive, I think, were the three phases of it mm -hmm. in terms of doing it. So I started off, my idea was to try and do, um, I went along to a, an event in Edinburgh. Uh, an old boss of mine invited me to uh, Lessons of Julius Caesar, Emotional and Political Intelligence by Richard Oliver. She says, I'm going to take you to this event in Edinburgh. And I went, I don't know. I don't know, Monday morning, listening to Shakespeare is going to be my dear of fun. But what the hell, I went along and it, it blew my mind. 
by how good it was. And when I got into the room, the guy wasn't Richard o Oliver, but Richard Olivier. It was Lawrence Olivier's son uh, doing wow. Olivier's And uh, I just sat, wide mouth, aghast, listening to this guy. And what he basically did was he took, he took Julius Caesar and he flipped it and started talking about lessons in emotional intelligence and political intelligence and did this whole live drama theatre where you could interact with the characters as he played them on stage mm -hmm. and had conversations with them. And it was, it was phenomenal. And it, and it gave me a seed of an idea that what would happen if I started a business where learning development is I took themes and stories and you know, lessons that I was familiar with or lessons that businesses had and actually build some narrative and some iconography around that, the way that Richard did with, with Julius Caesar. So that was my dream of what I wanted to do with the business. And uh, the first piece of work I had was actually in the travel industry, when it was the last piece that I'd worked, but they invited me to go back and do a bit of consultancy. So what I ended up doing was creating uh, eight travel, pro eight management development programs, but I theme themed them around different types of holidays and different types of destinations. So we talked about lessons in the wild, about safari. We talked about uh, coaching, around coaching people on the ski slopes to go faster. And but all these things that were all, because what I discovered quite quickly in a lot of the sectors I was working in was some of them didn't have a deep interest in personal development, but they had a deep interest in their industry. Yeah. So you might be really passionate about holidays if you were a travel agent per se, but maybe not quite as passionate about personal development. Now I know that's, I put a sweeping statement because everyone's going to be very different. If you think about sector norms, if you think of engineering and you've got really deep technical experts and you then try to develop a program that feeds into that technical expertise, then there's, you're trying to play to people's strengths and what they're mm. most interested in as well. So we made the program really colourful and really interactive and it really worked. I think the thing that um, it, it's really interesting about what you're saying there is I, I, I'm, I'm doing um, developing de developing a couple of different programs at the moment with a friend of mine called Brendan Melvin at Acuity Learning and Development, right. and and his background is you know and very much in leadership training and, and and that sort of things over the past 25 years, um, and so I'm asking a lot of questions because obviously my background is is more music and arts and that yeah. sort of thing. So I'm like, how relevant is it? And literally to your point about what you're saying about being specific to the industry, I said, you know, there's certain things when we're designing this program just now and we're talking about certain, you know, things that seem fairly basic to us in terms of like, uh, you know, original management theories and, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and all, all, all this kind of stuff that you, you, know, yeah. you learn at, at, at uni in terms of, you know, or management school and that kind of thing. Um, and what we're talking about was, he said, yeah, but for most of these, businesses that we're dealing with there's an awful lot of these people depending on, on the sector that they've got their management training on the job and it was very specific to the job so what might seem obvious you know in, in terms of oh well don't aren't you all familiar with these kind of processes and these kind of thoughts yeah. aren't necessarily because they were actually brought up using you know, practical techniques to their industry so being able to take something that's you know tried and true from from years gone by and then apply it to a different sector and just kind of yeah. frame it within that sector. Um, that's kind of, I think that's what where the interesting stuff is, you know? I, I, I don't think it has to be related to the sector. It just has to be a powerful enough story that carries a yeah. message. So, yeah. so again, the second piece that I did in that, that, that field was about a year and a half into consultancy. Um, I was approached by, um, a provider on behalf of BE Systems, and they were um, they were doing a briefing for international arms regulations, and they said, "Scott, could you help us with this communication?" And I went, "Sorry, <laughs> what do you mean?" And they went, "Well, what they were basically doing was a fifty-five minute briefing of one hundred and sixty-four slides, and wondering why people weren't getting the message." Oh, so all I did was basically ask some key questions, and I always think the more powerful the question. I think it was Einstein that said, if you didn't ask to solve a problem in 55 minutes of it's asking the best possible questions in five minutes is figuring out a solution. Sorry. Thought I was in silent now. Um, and uh, I, um, 
I said, well, if you're going to spend a long time doing this, we need to ask the right questions and all to help us to find a solution. So what I ended up doing was building a program that was three phases. It was about a typhoon air jet and the three phases of it on the ground, in the air and landing. And we built the three phases of the program around that. Dead simple. Yeah. Really simple visuals on it um, to make it really work. But just something that's really you know, simplistic and as easy as that as well. I think that's the thing is too, ma- too many people, especially when it's loads of complex information, there's just, it, you know, it's, it's, you know, keep it simple. You know, it, yeah. they might, they might have time some, some of the things you might want to do something that's the last program I did earlier this year was with, um, was with a business called the appreciate group who were part of the park group who do Christmas samples and everything. And they wanted to build a new vision for the business, which was to create more joy in the world. And gosh, do we need that right now? Mm. Uh, but um, their whole program is built around about happiness, and joy. Yeah. What myself and uh, my designer friend Tom put together was actually a character um, called an Imaginu, um, which was all about the power of imagination. And we created this whole mystical land that looked like something from the Yellow Submarine. Um, nice. With all these Liverpool icons on it, because it was based in Liverpool. The business is based in Liverpool. So we've got almost this cloud city with all these little characters doing things that celebrate imagination and joy in the workplace. But they're all representative of the business strategy. So there's a core business strategy there about, you know, the way that the business works and about the customer journey. But it's done through a visual storyboard and it's done through a series of programs as well. Mm-hmm. So that has that has very little to do with hampers, but loads to do with what a hamper does when you give it to someone, which is to create more joy and more pleasure for people. And also their business is far more than just hampers. It does lots and lots of other things and lots of other services. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, kind of, they're moving into more digital currency and the way in which they do things, but they want to you know, do more around gifting and the way in which they do things as well. So the whole program was built around about happiness and, and positivity as well. So I think we're going back to the very first thing I said at the start of our conversation. My creativity and my art at school was the thing that kept me really focused in school because I really enjoyed it and I've been able to play it out really well within my role. I've been able to take things and think differently about yeah. how I deliver business. And, you know, quite often when you do that with a the client, they, they started, interestingly, appreciate this group started with a model called discovery rather than joy um, is the way in which they want to approach the program rather than imaginate, sorry. And what we ended up was imaginate because we could take it anywhere. We could push it in any direction. We could put it in all different places. And um, as I say, I'll sketch everything out and then I use an illustrator to bring it to life. And then we'll bring the whole program to life. But again, I've done similar things in other businesses. I've, I've used exploration as a, a method for talking about change management. When you're talking about Maslow, you know, I did a program once where we, we built a theme park for a team of pharmacies um, that was all around about the change curve that we're going through at the moment, this change transition, that we based it on a roller coaster and said, you know, some mm-hmm. people want to ride the coaster and other people don't even want to go on it, but we're all going to have to travel down it in some way. Yeah. Um, we based the whole thing around about a theme park and the highlight of that was having, you know, hundreds of pharmacists at a fairground. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah. at, at the moment, how is, you know, your, your delivery um, changing? Um, and you know, obviously, with the, the current circumstances, are are you, are you being asked to, you know, look at um, you know, helpful sort of, you know, processes just you know currently, uh, and and sort of, is it is it something that's kind of, is there any way you can help us with a certain thing right now, whereas normally it would be planned out months yeah. in, months in advance. Um, so I, I've I've been really interested in the last. We, we've all had different circumstances and, you know, I myself, my, I had like four or five days where I just sat in my office and went, I'm doing nothing here. I'm just not being productive. I need to just get some headspace to think about things. But once I kind of got past that phase of not really doing anything, I thought, well, I need to pivot my business somehow in terms of how things work and how things operate. So um, What's been quite interesting is a lot of clients are coming to me and saying, what do you think we should do? Rather than saying, we're going to do this. So they're looking for advice and guidance in terms of what they could do. So a couple of examples of stuff that I spoke about um, this week to people. So um, as you know, when, when, when you came along to, to my event in Glasgow for Cognitize, 
um, which is another business that I run, which was um, a card-based game, but it's, it's primarily built for teams and to physically give a card to someone. And then when you give that card to someone, they then share it with someone else. And we can't actually do that at the moment mm -hmm. because of the whole passing of germs and things. And also we're not in the same physical place. But that business still has to exist. So I have to think, well, how can I pivot it? How can I do something different with it? Now, I've got loads of speakers who have produced video content for that. So what I've decided to do with it is focus more on the quality of the speakers rather than the actual cards at the moment. So I'm going to be running a series of webinars on subjects like resilience, emotional intelligence, creativity. But the angle of them all is to help people be you know, proficient and successful in a really difficult time at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and try to turn that around. But even on uh, the call I had this morning with Australia was about a group of 10 people that I've worked with in a program. Now I'm supposed to be in Australia in three weeks' time delivering a workshop for them. And uh, what we've decided to do is do a series of action learning sets online where we take a real workplace context problem they've got at the moment and work as a team to actually solve that problem and do some collective coaching so what i'm actually doing over the next couple of months is building their facilitation skills as well as solving the problems with them so you're constantly trying to do things like that to help people out and you know there's a massive upskilling there for people in terms of using zoom and teams and webex and all these systems so i, I spoke in a podcast the other week and i was saying that i think there's a real importance in the moment on dabble time that you allow people to go on and play with it rather than just go on and deliver on it Mm -hmm. and get used to how the system works and do you know I, I and about four other people last <clears> week just spent an hour online together just trying out all the different platforms and navigating through them and make sure we're all clear about the capacity and the things that they can actually do as well to make them work. I think that's the thing for me I mean I, 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 I'm I totally new to Zoom you know um, I, can, I think I used it once or twice before just on my phone but I, I didn't download it to the you know the my laptop and actually have it all working there um, and they're just kind of getting familiar with oh I can actually do this and I can share my screen and do that so at the moment I have a uh, a regular client who normally comes into my studio on a Tuesday night and uh, you know he sits across from me and we're, we're either you know working on, working on music or we're working on a music video for for his band and we we know that over the next sort of Two months we were really going to be doing two or three music videos that were going to be made up of existing footage that we had anyway so right. i'm like well i can video edit that's not a problem but by using zoom i can do the share screen function and literally he can be in the room looking at me with yeah. with with the edit so <clears throat> being able to do that and actually ha having that facility is just unbelievable and it means yeah. i'm able to function and do do certain things i'm like okay fine good that client i can i'm still able to 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 do that with him uh and that doesn't need to get put on hold whereas you know like yourself there's events and that sort of things where i need to be in in a room with people has all stopped i mean all the choir projects that i that i normally do um they're on hold for three months we've been told yeah. you know literally it's like at least three months. Yeah, all my watch is frozen. Everything up until the end of June is just frozen. Mm -hmm. But um, but then I've got other things that I'm doing. I've got design work I was working on, and, and all the clients that want to do something via, you know, digital communication rather than doing yeah. nothing. They just don't want to do anything right now because it's too soon. It's not the right time for stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of people want to attend development courses at this present moment in time until we see where we are in three weeks' time. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, the other thing I would suggest that I think is a good thing to think about is people's thinking approaches at the moment, the, the, the thought processes and the style of thinking. I was you know, admiring my books when, before we come onto the call there behind you. I think Edward de Bono is probably one of the, the main components of colouring your thinking appropriately in these times. So he yeah. talked about, you know, your six hats that you wear all the time and having the right mode of, of thinking. You know, I think having too much black hat thinking around at the moment and negative thinking is not going to necessarily help you to find a better business solution. Yeah. If you go for a bit more green and imagination and possibility, then you're going to get yourself into a better mindset. But then once you've done that, you say, well, white hat means what facts and things do I know at the moment about the market and about my particular business? And then do a bit of blue hat thinking to coordinate what you're going to do about it. 
then I think choosing the right mode of thinking will actually help you to navigate it rather than just sitting there and going, oh no, what am I going to do? Is yeah. actually choosing the mode of thinking to help you to solve those problems in the right order rather than just trying to solve the problem. Yeah, That's certainly how when I work on anything, when I'm designing anything, I'm going to work on anything and I'm trying to find my way through it. I try to use those modes to help me in the right way, to help to find the solution rather than just going down a, a hole and not necessarily finding the right output from it. Mm -hmm. Are you finding that, um, I mean, to that as well, that um, you know, you're saying initially, you know, you just had about five days where you weren't getting anything productive done. Um, are you finding that you kind of, are you starting to kind of find your creativity? Um, yeah, I have in the last few days, I think. Um, to say the first few days, I was feeling a bit vulnerable about it all, if I'm brutally honest, and um, kind of went into my shell a little bit and didn't really do anything. Mm -hmm. And then I opened, up a, I opened up a roller banner in my office, <laughs> and at the very top of it I read, with the world changing at such a pace, the combined craft of imagination and application will be vital, that I wrote six months mm -hmm. ago, and I thought, my god yeah it's relevant right now mm -hmm. and a bit too relevant <laughs> um and i thought you know i need to do something here i need to focus on something at the same time i had actually lots of people phoning me and saying can we do this can we do this can we do this and i'm going yeah but just give me a few days to breathe through this and focus on what needs to be done so yeah i think a week down the line i've got a more solid head in what i'm doing and how i'm doing it because I probably was my own worst enemy there and doing far too much black hatting mm -hmm. and too much red hatting around feelings and emotions of it all. Mm -hmm. um, it's an actual reaction to when you go through such a difficult time that everyone's experiencing, but yeah. it's how long you, you stay in that lull for before you find perhaps some other things that you can do to help. Yeah. Um, no, normally, uh, at, at this point in the, the conversation, I'm... Um, I would I would ask uh, certain questions around um, music and uh, you know what kind of music uh, you know that you listen to to get you in a certain creative headspace or you know uh, what what role does music play uh, on your, in your day to day and and just general creative creative creativity uh, and you know your workplace thinking. Um. I think it's quite different at the moment that the music I'm listening to is stuff that's keeping me focused and what I'm playing. Uh, I mean, I like my, I like a bit of rock music and um, something that I can really get in flow with. So, do you know, I sat yesterday and listened to um, some Pearl Jam while I was working away in the background and then I had Gorillaz on. Um, I had a little bit of Avon Dando's solo material on, just nice mm -hmm. acoustic stuff playing in the background, just something quite mellow and just something to keep me really focused. But I mean, music plays in a massive part and why I do my mouth is filled with quotes and, and lyrics. And as you were asking earlier on in the, the conversation about business plans, my business plan was littered with song lyrics <laughs> because it was a way to keep me focused on the stuff that, that yeah. really mattered. So I think music, it's one of my friends, uh, as you know, Kirsty said to me a couple of weeks ago about Islands of Sanity. Music at the moment is my island of sanity. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to find music within the space that I'm working in. Yeah. Um, to try and you know, keep focused on what I'm doing. I had so many concerts lined up in the next few months that I'm not sure are going to happen. So actually having virtual concerts are actually quite good. I was on, uh, I was on Facebook two nights ago, uh, last two nights ago, yeah, watching... Uh, John McClure from Rev Up the Makers, the a live acoustic set from his front room with his wife. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> mean, I, th I think that there's a, a lot of this kind of stuff that maybe even or ordinarily we're like, uh, for me, you know, my feed's normally, you know, littered with a lot of musicians doing these kind of things. And you are know, like, uh huh, right. And, and I, I, I certainly, you know, maybe take it for granted quite a lot of the time. But um, it's whenever you, you're seeing people who are meant to be out on tour just now and they're literally in yeah. you know, their front room doing something. You can like, yeah, this is really, really strange. Yeah. Uh, no, I had uh, Mike McCready from Pearl Jam play uh, a bit of an acoustic number in his bathroom two nights ago I was watching and <laughs> just looking at, I mean, it, there's a real human value in it that's keeping you excited, but also a real sincerity in the fact that there's a guy that's got Crohn's disease and he clearly feels a bit exposed to himself and vulnerable, but 
you could see it in his eyes that he's 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 trying his hardest to put a message out there and keep focused, but he's probably at the same time pretty stressed by it all. But they're still going out there to try and provide support to people. So I, I just think music's a good space to be in, yeah, um, at any point in time. But uh, yeah. I've had so many, you know, friends and colleagues who are really talented musicians and they're doing lots of live feeds and asking for requests and mm -hmm. you know streaming stuff as well, which has been brilliant actually sitting at night and actually just watching some of the music that's 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 whirring around things and there's so many yeah. tools as I say that should be should be happening right now that aren't but I think music's a good space to to exist within it really. Um, yeah definitely I don't know your office I'm presume quite similar but if just right behind me here I've got my my, my bowie wall on the left hand side here. Mm -hmm. My pedal jam one up here and I've got an assigned Dean Brown from the Stone Roses poster in the corner. Um, well, ordinar ordinarily, I mean, I would be doing, you know, this interview in my studio and you'd be surrounded by Bowie. Yeah. Uh, and I've got the, the, the vinyl on the wall uh, nice. and guitars on the wall and the, the original uh, album covers are on the yeah. wall there as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of similar to your space in that you're just surrounded by all these dynamic and, you know, yeah. vibrant images that, you know, just... I find it very inspiring just to kind of be, I mean, I, I absolutely love that space, you know. Um, yeah. It's, it, it's fine working from home, but uh, it's nice to have that cozy environment that is, you know, I know. your own kind of day. Well, here's, a, here's a musical reference point for you that I put in the office door of, um, if I'm doing recording like we're doing, that, that sits on the door. And uh, never mind the buzzwords, here's the learning lab. So I put quite a few things like that where I take uh, album covers and flip them into kind of posters and stuff as well mm -hmm. to, to see what you can use. So um, music's a, music's well, if you, <laughs> if you are looking for something new to listen to, you can go on Spotify and listen to me. Oh, well, uh, yeah. Fifty Shades of Greg. Right, cool. I'll go and check that out. Wow, yeah, that that kind of pun is just wow. Um, <laughs> but uh, if, but if you do like your rock, there's some there's some um, rockness on there, some stadium nice. rock stuff on volume two is kind of a bit more rock. There's some rock stuff in volume one, but it's kind right. of like it's like compilations of solo material from like 1996 to like present. So it's like it's all over the place stylistically, and you know just. It's good though. Very, I like very, the as well. Like, yeah. uh, um, I, I tend to find when I'm cooking, I've got a, a stack of soul classics by dead artists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. and try to listen to stuff, you know. Uh, they don't have to be dead to listen to, but I just, it's. Um, no, I you mean. Uh, there's some great stuff and going through a lot of early Motown stuff and everything. And, Love uh, Motown. I'm a huge stuff, Motown fan. Stuff like that. And, uh, even mm. a lot of Rolling Soul stuff, I absolutely love as well. But I, I haven't tuned myself back into listening to as much music as I normally would at the moment. But mm. um, new Pearl Jam album's out next Friday, so um, or this Friday rather, sorry. So uh, I'll get my my headset focused on that. But then, yeah. Week. Um, now, if you if you've had a chance to to listen to uh, any of my podcasts, um, you'll probably be familiar with the fact that the, the last question I normally ask people is. Um, many years from now, um, whenever you're no longer with us, what would you like your legacy to be? And this could be a personal or professional thing. Um, can be incredibly profound or, or just yeah. always a nice guy. <laughs> um, do you know the main thing would be, I, I think that people would find I was kind and I was generous in my time for them. I think that would be um, the most important thing that if we make more time for other people, we yeah the world becomes a, a far more equal place. And I think before any of everything, anything started and what we're currently facing at the moment, if the business was just a bit kinder and a bit more generous with its time and its support and a bit more patient by how it does, did things, and I think we, we would be in a, would have been in a, a, a far more caring and cultured environment. And I, I, I kind of got a bit of hope at the end of whenever the end of this um, horrible situation at the moment gets there, that we're we're a kind of society at the other end of it in terms of how we how we deal with each other. So kindness yeah. would be my my legacy, I think. Scott, thanks very much for joining me today, and uh, I just want to wish you and your family um, all the best. Really?
Likewise. really difficult time, but um, stay safe and well and hide in that shed at the, the bottom of well, yeah. the bottom of the garden. <laughs> Thanks very much. A pleasure. Thanks, Craig. Take care.